Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Richard Doms, the Vice President of U.S. Development with Joy Shad. We're an ecosystem of brands for women by women, connecting women to each other and to the companies, causes, and organizations that champion equity for women professionally and personally. Today, you're here with us watching our Women in Money show brought to you each and every Thursday. Please make sure to join us on our YouTube channel, Joy Shad, and our website, joinmayshad.com, to learn more about how you too can become a member of how together we're revolutionizing how professional women connect, engage, and do business together. I'm incredibly thrilled and honored to introduce Dave Matheson to the stage today. And Dave, what an incredible stage you have. This is, we are so jealous of where you are right now. <laughs> right. Well, welcome to Long Beach, New York. It's a beautiful day. And right after this call, I'm going to hit the beach. So you're all welcome to join me. I hope to see you out there. It's amazing. Mayshad Retreat, Long Beach, next time. <laughs> That's great. Dave, you're the, the chair and CEO of the CDO Club. Talk to us about after a rich career in publishing software technology, what inspired you to launch the CDO Club? It was really uh, building a community. You know, uh, this is a group that is at some of the world's most prestigious organizations. And uh, breaking down the acronym a little bit, you know, CDO stands for both Chief Digital Officer and Chief Data Officer. So we kind of hit the, the trifecta in addition to the CAO title, Chief Analytics Officer. But around 10 years ago, I noticed that the title was gaining of a lot of traction as I was the uh, executive director or managing director of a boutique executive search firm. And as you can imagine, two really big groups should have been paying attention. Those two groups were search firms like Russell Reynolds, Spencer Stewart, because these people get very high salaries and recruiters get 30% of the first year cash comp. So these guys make 500,000 and up a year, the cash comp for a recruiter is 150,000. And if you got, you know, working on 10 to 12 deals a year, that's a million dollar practice. And if you've got 10 recruiters in your firm, that's a nice, you know, practice area. Uh, the other group that should have paid attention was the analysts, Forrester, Gartner, you know, uh, McKinsey, all the others. They really had no dedicated digital or data practice 10 years ago. And now, of course, everyone does. So I kind of caught the curve at the beginning and uh, was fortunate enough that that recruitment firm CEO had ha I had her blessing and she sponsored every one of our events subsequent to that. And we've built out the world's largest group of these people. We started on the ground and it's a global organization as well. We've got affiliate partners in Tokyo and Tel Aviv, and we've done events all over the world. Talk to us a bit about how, you know, how your work has, has changed over time as well, particularly when we're talking about data and digital and you know, all things related to the way in which things are analyzed, right? Like there's been so much transformation just in that space in the last 10 years, let alone the last 30 years. What have been some of your biggest aha moments to date throughout the course of the last, say, 30 years of your career? You know, 30 years. I mean, I've been in data since my first job in the world was uh, London Electricity Board in London in 1981. And I was a data wrangler. You know, I'm kind of still scratching my head is why it took so long for that title to make it to the C-suite. I do have some you know, opinions on that. But um, my three biggest aha moments all resulted in companies. So I, I guess <laughs> the first was uh, the, the onset of the Internet. I joined Reuters at the absolute right time, because if you're a content guy, you know, Reuters had all the candy, uh, all the um, ice cream in the multimedia rainbow, if you will. It had, you know, stock quotes in real time, foreign exchange data, in addition to really big assets like video and photos from journalists all over the world. And then all that real time data that needed to be sent to banks and traders worldwide so that there's no arbitrage when people have better information than others. So that was my first aha moment was the standardization of HTML over HTTP. Because in the past, I had built products for Reuters that were, you know, focused on developing Rain Man for AOL and, you know, whatever the development environment was for some of the other bigger platforms. That standardization just helped drive what I developed, which was standardized syndication. There were no standard ways to syndicate data over the Internet before RSS. And about five years before RSS was invented, I was doing this stuff for Reuters. So that was a big aha moment that now Reuters, the biggest news agency in the world, doesn't have to rely on this massive satellite, you know, expensive satellite system that, by the way, sometimes goes out of whack. I remember standing on the building of a roof, the roof of a building, trying to readjust my satellite dish to point to a new satellite. So because one of their satellites went down, these are real world implications, I would say. The second big aha moment was my next company, which was called Connecta. I started that in 1998, and that aha moment was really seeing the need 
for um, you know content management systems to have syndication technology embedded into it. So I started my own company in '98, went out to California, raised 30 million in, in three rounds in two years, and that company was based on you know the same thing: how do we standardize syndication and and embed our technology into Vignette, Documentum, uh, you know Stellant and uh, WordPress and things like that. So that took off like a rocket and within two years got acquired by Stellant. And then Stellant got bought by Oracle for 440 million in 2004. And so from that point, I was kind of just uh, semi-retired, you know, decided to write a book. And that was the my third aha moment, which was I wrote a book called Be the Media. And the book in 2002, I started it, was an attempt. And what shocked me was that just how bad um, authors, musicians, filmmakers, journalists, photographers have it. That, you know, the, the goal was always to sign a major label contract, which in essence was slave labor. You know, it would rip you off or you'd get maybe 5% royalties and the publisher would get 85 to 90% of it. And it was just like that across the board. And I just said, you know what, with the onset of the internet, there's got to be a better way uh, for independent authors, musicians, journalists, and photographers, et cetera, to go around that system and to use the internet to find their f- true fans and really find their audience. And, you know, it resulted in a book and I'm pretty proud of it. If I were to do it all over again, I probably would have created a platform instead of writing a book. So I think the only downside to this renaissance in independent media that's happening today is the financial relationships are still out of whack. You know, if you're a musician, now you got to get your music up to Spotify and you got to get it to Pandora and you got to get a billion views before you're going to get 10 bucks. So there's still this ripoff relationship between the platforms and the artists themselves. And my pitch in Be The Media was forget those platforms, build your own audience, find your true fans and keep giving them more of what they want. And maybe you won't make those you won't make millions of sales, but you may actually net out the same or even better with fewer fans because they're paying you and you're keeping 100 percent of the royalties. So I think that aha moment is still ongoing. And what I mean by that is I think blockchain is the future for independent publishers and to have a direct relationship with their fans and also to have an immutable, uh, transparent uh, blockchain that can track the transactions and with smart contracts embedded into every piece of music or PDF, you can actually have contracts that will pay the independent artist wherever that content ends up. And I think this was impossible to do without something like a blockchain solution. Still not there yet, but I think that's probably my next company. How do you think COVID will complicate everything you just said in the sense of some of this, some of the white space, but then also, you know, in a world where there's already so much content out there, right? So how do, how do companies that are having to now in this moment in time go from, you know, either brick and mortar or physical face-to-face work as they, you know, transfer their worlds to the digital space, there's a lot of complexities with that, particularly given the sense that space was already overcrowded. It's overcrowded. Yeah. Yeah. How do you really stand above and beyond others in your space when there's already so much noise? That is exactly the biggest problem. So now that all of the technical hurdles have been overcome and, um, you know, the ability to the costs of creating a piece of work, whether it's a photo or, or an article and the cost of distributing that work are approaching zero, if not zero already. That's the wonderful thing about where we are today. The downside is now that everybody can create music and anybody can create a book, everybody is. So how do you then go out and you know promote yourself in a world where it's so saturated? Uh, that's the biggest challenge independent artists have had in the past and will continue to have is getting attention. So, But I would say related to COVID, COVID has actually accelerated digital transformation to the point where Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, recently was quoted as saying, we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in just two months, right? So all of those last mile applications for organizations that may have been on the back burner, work from home, remote work, telemedicine, remote learning, you know, ed tech, all of those things like the corner deli being able to deliver to you, 7-Eleven being able to deliver, um, those kinds of things were the hardest things that me as a, the head of this digital community, we're always trying to get that last mile. Well, the pandemic actually accelerated that. And now people are actually familiar and are used to. The biggest change isn't technology, it's cultural change. 
And there hasn't been something that drove such technological adoption, in my opinion, since 2007. And before that, it was 1995. So I, I would think that the big drivers of change in the last 30 years, the first was standardization, HTML over HTTP and the internet as we know it. The second one was the iPhone launch. It basically gave everybody in the world access to computing power and to every piece of music on earth that they never had before. And that cultural shift was a dramatic one. And now we're finding that the latest cultural shift wasn't a technology shift, it was a pandemic. And the pandemic forced companies and individuals to change their behavior. You can't do that. You can't legislate that. You can't force it. And in some ways, the pandemic, in a lot of ways, for my community anyway, it has accelerated the pace of change to a degree that no other technology could have. Yeah, it's interesting. Right before you know, hopping on this this conversation today, we we're interviewing a woman who's in fintech, and she said that you know, in her space, it's accelerated 30, 30 years, years almost. In, in sure. of just, of just, you know what's happening from, you know, from now to you know the this new new frontier. I want to talk a bit about, like when you mentioned cultural change, I often can't help but think about, you know, the way in which we at Misha think about diversity, equity, inclusion. And, you know, you're speaking with me today on our Women in Money show. And the reason why you and I are having this conversation is because I'm really interested to know, you know, the degree to which your ecosystem also realizes gains from how the democratization of media and digital has really advanced how we think about equality for women and in what ways has it hindered it? In what ways would you like to see more progress? I guess that's what I'm asking. Sure, that's a great question because um, it, when I started the book, Be the Media in 2002, the goal was to have it, all of the chapters were contributed by individuals and companies like the Creative Commons, et cetera. And my goal when I started out with the book was to have it really be um, written and compiled by women and minorities, underserved voices in the media. And I got the attention of Ruth Ann Harnish at the Harnish Foundation, and she underwrote 5,000 books. She bought 5,000 books before I even printed it because she loved that that's what I was doing. And we sent those books to you know women in media. We sent them to, uh, she's a TED fellow. We sent them to thousands of TED fellows. We actually got the book into the hands of journalism, media, and communication schools all over the country. So the goal was to really provide some more diversity into the media and not just have a bunch of white men you know, tell, tell people what they should be doing. The second big piece for me was I joined the Chattuck Ellig Group. That's where I incubated the CDO Club and CDO Summit. It's a boutique executive search firm in New York City run by women. It's a women-owned and operated company. They prided themselves on only having women employees. I was the first male ever hired. And Janice Ellig is very famous in the New York City area. She does diversity uh, placements. She uh, is dedicated to getting more slots for women on boards and women as CEOs. And every year she holds what they call the Breakfast of Corporate Champions at NASDAQ. Uh, once a year, Janice hosts this event where she brings together and celebrates women who are succeeding in the corporate world. And uh, it's a fabulous event. So, you know, to, trying to tie that all into, you know, where this is going, there are some infrastructural challenges that just can't be overcome by one individual. Janice can do the best she can. I can try the best. You know, I can tell you, I got turned down by more women to contribute to be the media, and it ended up being more men than women in that book. Uh, same thing when we produce events. I got a lot of flack for producing an, an event in Japan, even though I produced events for 10 years, you know, one a month for 10 years, I got flack from people because I had this one event in Japan that had all CDOs, and of course they were all men. Well, guess what? Japan doesn't hand out C-level titles as promiscuously as we do in the States or in Europe. Number two, they don't have a lot of women in C-suite titles. Number three, there's not a lot of women in data or digital, period. So, you know, it's challenging enough when you produce events. You know, I always say I'd like to be judged by my career and not by one eight-hour event on one day in Tokyo, Japan. But there are some infrastructure issues that we're, we continue to face. So, you know, it's systemic in some countries. It's hard to, you know, change. Fortunately, here in the States, especially in Europe, you know, they have a mandate in the UK that there you have to have X percentage of women on boards. Uh, that's just the law. And uh, I think those are you know, good ways to achieve it as well. Uh, but I also think there's some positive signs on the horizon. And here's a couple of them. Number one, this year, we, we at the CDO Club track the number of CDOs who've become CEO or board director. 
And on a very positive note, this first half of this year, uh, we had 13 CDOs become board directors on listed companies. That's more than twice all of last year. And in addition, nine of those 13 CDOs who became board directors are women. Sheila Jordan, Chief Digital and Technology Officer over at Honeywell. She joined the board of Slack. I love the fact that you got an incumbent company and she's joined the board of a startup. You got um, Jackie Wright over at Microsoft. She's Chief Digital, Officer, Chief Digital Officer there. She joined the board of Envent, right? There's, there's, there's seven others. But this is inspiring to me. This is the kind of thing we want to encourage and uh, we want to see more of. So, you know, my, part of my goal at the CDO Club is to make sure there's gender diverse, diversity on boards and, and in the C-suite. I, Dave, you know, it's interesting is, you know, I, I know that so much of the beautiful work that you do is actually beautiful because it's face to face. And and so COVID, of course, has disrupted how we think about just engaging our, our ecosystems. And for Meshad, we were hosting live events in New York City up through the first week in March. And, you know, now we went to all things digital within, you know, a week and a half time period and have done that very successfully. Um, but would love to hear from you, you know, your perspective of in what ways is this new sort of world under which we're operating more beneficial to your business? And in what ways is it still causing um, uh, some of that longing for the in-person human interaction? Yeah, you can't replace that interact. I mean, we've done events for 10 years, you know, one a month. Uh, there's no replacing that first level connection. But an interesting contrary opinion to that, we had Linda Avery. We gave Linda the CDO of the Year Award uh, last year for her work at the Fed. She worked for 20 years at Morgan Stanley and then five years at the Federal Reserve of New York. She's a strong woman in a man or dominated you know, world, and she has excelled in every one of them. So we gave her the CDO of the Year Award. She subsequently jumped sector. She went from financial services to Verizon. And her famous quote on this, well, one of her great quotes was on the network, you know, on, on, on Verizon, uh, Mother's Day used to be the biggest day of the year when there was so much connectivity. Uh, and the pan when the pandemic started, she said every day is Mother's Day. You know, that's the kind of volume that they were getting across the network. So, you know, um, there, the other quote that she had, though, was uh, related to this, which is we always feel like these kinds of conference calls are impersonal. But when you think about it, you just saw my background. You saw where I live, you see the view. It's a perspective on me that you and your listeners and viewers probably wouldn't have had if we met at an event in New York City, right? What Linda said was she's now having the ability, by the way, she moved 100,000 people to work from home within like weeks. So talk about digital acceleration, right? These are the kinds of things that we had hoped for as a digital community, but we think we thought we'd never achieve, and yet it happened in weeks, right? But her her quote was that now she's getting to see her employees, their homes, their dogs, their families, maybe they got kids, you know, that come in and out of the Zoom call that you can't help. And she's getting more of a 360 degree perspective on her employees, her partners, and, and people like me. So maybe it's added another dimension. Maybe it's not that bad, you know, maybe this is a new world, we're gonna to have to live in it and let's adapt and adopt. But uh, I do miss the face-to-face -face things. You know, I had a call this morning with a very big event producer in Spain. They get 25,000 people a year there, they're in Madrid. And you know, they, the event was scheduled for May, they rescheduled to September, now they're rescheduling again the next May. I didn't take that approach. I said to my people who bought tickets to my event, we're, can we're rescheduling the event, but I don't know when I'm gonna re-up it because what would be the purpose of rescheduling it only to have to reschedule it again. You just keep, keep kicking that can down the road. So my perspective on this was we're rescheduling it. When we come back to it, we'll let you know. And in the meantime, I gave everybody who bought a ticket a platinum subscription to or platinum membership to the CDO Club for sponsors. We're giving them free webinars this year. And if and when you know New York comes back, uh, we'll redo it. But I think the challenge is as an event producer, you don't want to reschedule an event when you don't, you're not sure if the venue is going to let you be there. You're not sure if state, local, and federal right. regulations will allow you to have it. And there are corporate travel restrictions on almost every sponsor, speaker, and attendee. What would be the point of rescheduling something? I don't have a magic eight ball. So we rescheduled it with no new date. And, you know, most likely is I don't think we're going to be doing an event until second half of next year at best when it's, you know, safe to do it. And certainly I don't want to be the cause of a super spreader event in my community. I'd never live that down.
Right, right, right. And that's so many really interesting points that you that you mentioned. And I wonder, you know, from your mem- members' perspective, yes, like, we're all missing the human interaction, right? Because you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That beats that. that, beats that. Um, but, but also wondering, you know, for you and the conversations you're having, what else are you finding or as we think about leadership in this moment in time? When we think about, you know, right. what does that mean for visitor leaders in, in this space in which they serve? What's coming up as the white space? What's still missing for them? We did an event, I did a webinar with IBM called CDOs Leading During Turbulent Times, which was like the first month into the pandemic. And uh, they all, I had the CDO of Verizon, Linda Avery, the chief data officer for Dun & Bradstreet, uh, Anthony Scrifignano, and the global CDO from IBM, Indrapal Bandari. And it was all about leadership. And, you know, I think you might know I'm also on the board of directors for Pace University School of Business Transformative Leadership Program. And the quote Interpol had really struck me was that um, it's it's a, it's evolving, and you can't. Uh, sometimes I think uh, leaders were conflating civil unrest and the pandemic. You have to separate things because the leadership style you take during a pandemic, or that people took during the pandemic, was very technical. It was very digital. It was very data oriented. You know. How do we rearrange work from home? How do we handle people in you know, remote locations? But the leadership style for the civil unrest, uh, in Interpol's opinion, was much more human centered. It was much more about sitting your teams down and just listening, asking the right questions, not giving opinions, especially Asian Americans, Black Americans, females, taking the time to just listen. That's a leadership style that I think plays very well when people are uncomfortable, when when they may have issues they're not talking about out loud or at the water cooler, but that affect performance. So, you know, leadership styles change and evolve. But I think the most important thing for a leader today is to make sure that their style adapts to the current condition. There seems to be a crisis popping up every day. Leadership styles have to evolve. You can't take the same approach for a pandemic that you take for civil unrest. But love to hear your thoughts on that. That, uh, Yeah, I I absolutely agree. I think that there's a whole different level of emotional intelligence and skills that we all have to tap into, not just to get through this forever, how long COVID lasts, but I think that people are also questioning, and we see this a lot within our ecosystem, they're questioning their own identity. They're questioning their relationship to their work. They're questioning their relationship with, you know, working from home. And what does that mean in the sense of ensuring that you still feel a part of all of the social networks that, that helped you to do what you needed to do to be who you are and all that's been disrupted. Right. And so now how can we ensure as, for example, professional working women, no matter what industry or job function that we hold, that we're still staying fresh and relevant and current in our careers and at the same time making sure that we're connecting to each other at a human level right? yes right. We're, we're fine. and you know there was a vc that said this to me many months ago now in the earlier stages of COVID. she's like i kind of feel like i've lost my identity she said yeah. you know, she's married has kids at home she's homeschooling at least six hours every day she said you know i basically have lost all the support mechanisms that really help me to do my job to help me be a vc I've lost, you know, the the daycare, I've lost the nanny, I've lost yeah. the housekeeper, I've lost the gardener, right? And and yes, like we're, we're slowly bringing all that stuff back now in the sense of how we just let other people into our space, but still that's forever changed. And I think that, you know, what we're seeing men and women are really questioning, who do I want to be when I grow up? Given the fact that we're all realizing how short life is, particularly for those of us who have either had COVID ourselves and have lost or lost loved ones. And so it's even you know, how you think about your daily commute, right? And what that looks like right. too, you know, how you think about leaving your legacy and creating your legacy to, um, you know, what kind of company do I want to be associated and affiliated with? And right. we saw this in the past where millennials and women would, when, you know, be very values driven in the sense of how we spend money and how we invest and how we save. But I think more so now than ever, there's just sweeping understanding that something's got to change. Right. So, Dave, remember like how we all used to say in the beginning of COVID, like, we can't wait till life goes back to normal. Well, right. maybe it's time to think about the ways in which normal wasn't really working in the past and use this as a moment where it's not necessarily forced change, but getting ahead of it. Like, how do we all get ahead of it and how do we use technology and data and, you know, um, themes around sustainability and the empowerment of women and, and people of color to really 
think through the intersectionality of how all these different things that were so seemingly siloed in the past really come together and create yeah. something in a very different cohesive way. Oh, agreed. You know, that's the leadership style that should happen right now is that this isn't slowing down. The problems that we're seeing are not going to slow down. Unfortunately for me, I'm my own personal opinion. I mean, I gave a, 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 an analyst quote on this in January. I said, this the economic downturn is going to last between two and four years. And everybody thought I was crazy. We're, we're almost a year into this. And the economic downturn is not going to turn around anytime soon. We got a president that was just in the White House. You know, there's a lot of uh, people and companies and the market very unsure of things. So I think from a leader's perspective, calm down a little bit. You know, don't push as hard. Understand that there are people at home working from home now that are contending with their entire families and they've got to potentially educate their children while they're trying to hold Zoom calls for their business. You know, mm -hmm. these are unprecedented times and People that normally showed up at work for an eight hour day now have all other kinds of pressures on them. Even though you think, oh, they're working from home, they can do whatever they want. Yeah, but they can't really. They've got to deal with their kids. You know, there's a lot of issues today. But I would say, too, if I could give one message to women out there, you know, having tried my best, and I can give you loads of examples of approaching women to contribute to be the media. And also every month we've got a webinar to do. We out we we over index on inviting women. Because what ends up happening is we get more declines from women than we get from men. It seems more men are willing to say yes to contributing to a chapter or to joining you on a webinar. I do not know why that is. I'm not a woman. I don't want to, you know, sort of explain that for them or for you. But my assumption is that women are under a lot of pressure to deliver at work. And they're under pressure that maybe the men aren't under because they want to overperform or they want to overindex the males in the company. So they feel like if they take time out to do a chapter or jump on a webinar, it's one hour that they don't have to do work and maybe their boss would be upset with them. That's just an assumption on my part. But my message to women would be say yes more often. You know, if somebody approaches you to join a conference, to be on a webinar, to contribute to a book, all of those things actually add to your credibility, your legitimacy. Uh, they give you a name and a, and a platform from which to use when you go to your next job or your next career. Uh, and, you know, the problem with that is if you keep saying no, the event producers are going to stop calling because, you know, that's what it, what ends up happening. And then, again, we get stuck in that awkward position of trying to explain ourselves with that Japanese, you know, Tokyo summit where I was like, look, I reached out to 30 women and 10 men. All 10 men said yes. 28 women said no. We end up with two women and then we get complaints from women that, that, the, that this, the agenda isn't balanced. So uh, I don't know if that's helpful or if I'm way out I'm in here. But well, I would know, say it's, it's Yes. Yeah, Dave, thank you, first of all, for sharing that, sharing that, sharing your experiences, because I think that this is this is honestly how we create change, right? By having yeah. these conversations that could be seemingly construed as being uncomfortable, but yet really peeling back the layers and getting to the heart of the matter of what really truly isn't working, right? Right. I think, you know, an answer, and I, I'm just supposing here without knowing a lot of details about the, the particular circumstance in which you speak, but, you know, I, I know that, you know, from, you know, from the work that we do, women get asked to do a lot. And, right. and I think that we often get asked to solve the gender problem as if it's our own problem, but excluding <laughs> men from the conversation or from the solution. Right. And so I think that there's often, um, a perspective that we have where we get asked to do so much, we get asked to help so many other people and organizations sure. and companies. And then it's hard to be able to step back and assess because exactly, I agree. Like we all need to be seen more. We need right. to volunteer for speaking engagements. We need to speak at conferences. We need to deliver keynotes. We need to work on our personal brand. We need to do the social media. Yes. We, need, we know that we know that we need to do all of these things, but I think that there's often the challenge lies within understanding how to really prioritize it to know in what ways do we feel obligated to help because we're helping others versus those instances where we're helping ourselves. Right. That's, advancing that's, the career. Yeah. Exactly. That's the, that's the key. And that's something that I think that women struggle with. Like in what ways do we need to be better at investing in ourselves versus investing in our families and our communities and our friends and all the other ways in which we nurture and care for others, we all exactly. see ourselves last. And I see this firsthand day in and day out where we excel again in being that nurturer, playing that caregiving role, 
but we often are not our own best champions when it comes to celebrating ourselves. Right. And I'll say that, you know, women for the most part, and there are exceptions to every rule, but I often feel that, um, you know, we feel like we need to be an expert, um, a perfectionist, um, that we're not worthy or deserving unless we feel like we've accomplished, you know, the C-suite level of whatever, you know, Fortune 50 company. Um, and that we don't have anything of value to share or contribute unless we're up here, right? right. Men don't feel that way. <laughs> no, they'll, they'll, they'll talk and talk and talk, even if they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> right. And so there's a there's a different way that I think I'm hoping that for whoever's watching the show today, no matter if you're a woman or a man, or no matter how you identify in terms of gender, but lift other women up to help us feel more confident and more comfortable and more self-assured with putting ourselves out there and saying, yeah, I deserve to be a keynote speaker. Yes, absolutely right. I can contribute in a valid way to that conversation, or I have something to offer, you know, in the sense of how I promote myself. And I really think the self-promotion aspect of it, we see that is not a positive thing. And I really feel like we need to turn our mindsets and our, our thinking around that. You know, that reflects my exact experience today. I can't give out the name or the company or the event, but um, with IBM, we reached out to a woman and she said, look, that topic, I'm not, we're not there yet. You know, we're just starting our journey for that particular topic and I don't feel comfortable yet. And it was funny because the woman at IBM did the back and forth. I didn't want to get in the middle of it. And it was good that she did because she said, no, you know, you're perfect for this because there's a lot of other people out there that are going to be listening who are in the exact same place you are. And I think she was afraid, like you said, that she wasn't going to be the other two people on the panel are men and they're very big companies. And maybe she was a little intimidated. But actually, we want her perspective. We want to hear that. And so does everybody else that's in that same position. So, you know, you don't have to be 100 percent or perfect. Like you just said about most men, <laughs> they're, they're definitely not perfect, but they certainly get out there and give their opinion. Right. <laughs> Yes, and that's what I'm really, truly hoping that 2020 is a year of many things, <laughs> but I'm really hoping it's a year where women really do see the need to step up. And, and I, you know, I think the phrase lean in is so overused, so, so overused, but I think that there's a lot of validity to just the, you know, claiming your power, like claiming your, claiming your self-worth, claiming the ability to really position yourselves as an expert. And look, like we've all had very different, unique experiences. I also think, Dave, in the sense of going back to the, the point of our conversation earlier around the oversaturation of content, I feel like there's an oversaturation of content, but I don't feel like there's an oversaturation of storytelling. Right. And one of the spaces where there is white space is the sense of understanding at the individualistic, humanistic level that we're all the beautiful, we're, we're the sum of all of our beautiful parts, and that pertains to our history and our heritage. Like what led you to be where you are today against that beautiful ocean background? backdrop right. right like what led me to be who i am today based upon all my past corporate and philanthropic and just life experiences um and i think that we're not doing enough of that storytelling i think that women aren't doing enough of that storytelling because right. we're not taking due credit for what we actually have accomplished right like how many times do you hear a woman say oh i just you know i fell into that role or i got so lucky or you know i just happened to be at the right place at the right time no we all need to quit saying that and actually that's say that we deserve to be where we are <laughs> yeah it's hard work it and by the way we we went down the conversation of of women th this conversation but the um, um, i think what you brought up was and by the way remind me to come back to storytelling it's so important but the i think the point of your last question was about the new normal as well right so yeah, i completely yeah. I was on an interview this morning uh, with Tokyo, a very early morning interview. And, um, uh, you know, my point was normal wasn't great. I mean, normal was overconsumption. It was plastic. It was pollution. It was, you know, commuting and not, not unnecessary travel, you know, train, plane, you name it. And to me, I don't want to go back to the new normal, the, the whole back to normal. The whole point, I think, of uh, the wonder, I God, I shouldn't say the wonderful thing about the pandemic was, but it finally gave us all of that digital transformation. I, I know you brought up the word digital disruption. I've been working 10 years to get people to use the word transformation rather than disruption because anybody can disrupt, right? I mean, even our current occupant of the White House is a great disruptor, but is he transforming, right? <laughs> Most important is digital transformation, not disruption. And I think that posing for a new normal 
it has to be less commuting, less reliance on fossil fuels, more telecommuting, even remote education, telemedicine, all of these things that require cultural change that the pandemic facilitated. I think we need to double down on all that and not try to go back to the old normal. And that could mean a significant financial jolt. I don't I do not think the commercial real estate is coming back. Uh, no matter what happens, I think, you know, Google, other companies, they're just not going to go back. They're going to keep working from home. And if that's the case, what happens when the rent comes due in all those buildings in New York City in, in especially areas like um, where they rebuilt that whole West Side, the West Side uh, area, I forget what uh, they call Hudson it. Hudson Yards. Yeah, Hudson Yards. Who's going to go in there? Nobody's in there now. Do they really expect any tenants in the next six months or a year? Absolutely not at those rates. So something's got to give. And when commercial real estate takes a dive, uh, home real estate values are going to dump too. So, you know, there's a lot of adjustments that's going to, that's, that is inevitable over the next year, uh, which is kind of scary. Uh, so at the same time, how do we bolster our financial positions? Uh, there are companies that are going to succeed, you know, move to Zoom, move to, you know, Amazon. That's what we're doing. We changed our model. It wasn't hard for us because we've always worked from home. We've always had remote offices. And by God, we're a chief digital officer community. If anyone should be doing something online and virtual, it should be us. We should be leading that example. And we are. So I don't foresee a day where we're going to go back to physical events. And again, it goes back to not so much. I don't want to do them. It's that we can't. Mm -hmm. And until we receive the approvals and then once we do, there's still going to be a cultural change in people's minds, a behavioral change that I don't know when that's going to change. You could get a green light on venues, but that doesn't mean people are going to want to jump. Uh, for an example, when when do you think you'll be comfortable getting in a taxi, jumping on a plane, getting into JFK, grab, grabbing a cab, getting a hotel for two or three nights, taking a cab or a subway to the venue, spending all day with 100 to 1,000 people, and then reversing it to get all the way home? When do you think you'll be comfortable doing that? I don't think people, you know, well, there's a question for you. I don't think there's a time. I can't foresee a time where I want to do that anytime soon. So that behavioral change trumps the technology change and also the regulations by you know a long shot. You know, Dave, what I think is really interesting right now is that we're seeing, you know, the world becoming much more global in the sense of the digital transformation to which you speak, but then also much more local in the sense of that we all have to have some level of human action engagement. But there are ways to do that from a, a micro perspective where you're able to achieve that. But yet not but have it distract from your overall business purpose. Like, for right. example, we've done two now, um, two half-day retreats in Central Park. Where we're bringing together That's very super. small groups of women together for um, everything from, you know, really smart intellectual conversations around what's happening, what's innovating right now to where the white space is, to yoga and meditation. Um, uh, very, very limited number of people, small groups, social distance, we're in compliance, we're outside. Um, now, will we go back to a world where we would host on a monthly basis anywhere from 150 to 200 women? No, for all the reasons that you mentioned, right? Because there's a lot of risk. And those things that we took for granted every single day, like just hopping in an Uber and or, you know, having dinner in a restaurant or, you know, being around 100 to 1,000 people at a conference, right? Like, right. We never thought twice about doing that in the past, but now that's a part of our daily process in the sense of how we yeah. think about our own risk levels, right? But I think that there's so much opportunity to be very local in the sense of, okay, so we may not be commuting on Metro North anymore going into the city, but are there opportunities in your own small community or in your own neighborhood if, you're, if you live in a big city to really create some sense of added value for how you connect with humanity then keeping into perspective the values that we're actually receiving, the economies of scale, yeah. the scale and the growth of having the experiences like what you and I are having digitally right now. You know, there's a great quote from Anthony Scrifignano, the chief data scientist at Dun & Bradstreet. He said, just because you closed your front door doesn't mean you closed your business. And, you know, I look out behind me right now and I can tell you at sunrise, there's a group of a dozen women who come out on the beach, get in a circle, and the instructor's in the middle, and they do their, you know, uh, Bikram yoga. And they come back out at sunset, uh, so twice a day. And I found out subsequently, it's the Bikram yoga store, uh, you know, on the street down the road from me, instead of being worried about closing their business, they just, they're doing it outside. And 
I think it speaks to, you know, Regal Cinemas, right? I got an email today that Regal is closing every one of their cinemas. That's 863 or 1,000 cinemas. Well, the question is, what are you doing? You know, like there's been some resurgence, for example, in drive-in movies. There's an empty lot right next door to me on the beach and they put up a big screen and there's a big empty lot. So they're basically bringing people in in their cars to watch the movie uh, in this empty lot. And it's basically locals that got together and said, let's have a movie night. It's not regal. Nobody's giving them permission. Um, so I would say to those companies that are struggling like Regal Cinema, great that you're closing out your expense loophole, but what are you doing to keep revenues going? What are you doing to stay in front of people? There's a lot of things you can do. There's, you know, bays right here where the Jones Beach Theater is in the middle of a bay. Why not put up a screen and have every Friday night boats? There are boats that, you know, moor off of that whenever there's a concert at Jones Beach Theater. Well, why not keep it open, you know, until the winter and have boats come and watch movies? There's a lot of things companies can do if they just think a little bit outside of the box. And if you don't, you know, there's not much time left for you because this really I don't think it's going to be over next year. I mean, this the economic impact of this is going to last a lot you know, longer than the pandemic. Dave, I'm Dave, reminded by what happened with Blockbuster Video um, and what, what happened with Kodak, right? Like two companies, two incredibly well-respected global companies who weren't able to stay ahead of the curve, right? And I think that for companies now, there are a lot of learning lessons we can take from companies like that this time around but also learning lessons that we can take from companies like, you know, like when you think of all the big retail giants that have really suffered even before COVID, but the writing was on the wall for in the, in the way in which we all engage with brands now as well, was companies that are thriving were way ahead of the curve and very smart to be very close to the customer in the sense of understanding at what moments in times preferences were shifting. Right. So when you do your comment about commercial real estate in, in New York City, you know, I think that there will be some sort of reinvention that happens where right. space will be utilized, but it's definitely not going to be utilized in the same way. The Time Life Center right now, um, on what is it, 6th and 47th, 48th, in that yeah. general area, every day 8,000 people used to work in that, that office space. Now there's less than 500 people that go into that space every single day, right? So there's so much opportunity to really reimagine how we relate and use space. And maybe we shouldn't have been, you know, when you think about, you know, all the co-working companies of the world, like maybe we shouldn't all have been on top of each other in the way that we were working, you know, it's yeah. just like it's, you know, to your point, it's just what was what was in the past wasn't working. Yeah. And you have to let go of what worked in the past and what, what's working now and really focus on the current. Matter of fact, Linda from Verizon said they used to look at the data from the past to give them an idea of what to expect going forward. And when the pandemic hit, all that old data is useless. Forget about it. You can't use that old data to predict what's going to happen tomorrow because every day is Mother's Day, as she said, you know. And uh, so, you know, also you go back to like WeWork or Convene or any of those business models where, you know, WeWork had just raised all that money. They had the problem with the CEO. Convene tried to be a lot like WeWork. They've got empty space now. Not only were they using Convene spaces for events, but also for like a WeWork situation where you could buy a desk or rent, lease a desk for months. And uh, what's their business model? They, they just raised a ton of cash. Their valuation was through the roof. Uh, what's their future? And even bigger than that, what happens with Javits? What happens with Moscone? You know, those are huge places with nobody. They, they can't last much longer without some kind of help um, just to cover the, the rent and the insurance on those spaces. They're massive spaces. Uh, so the big readjustment is still ahead, I would say. So the goal today is be as flexible as you can bolster your revenue streams, get as many different revenue streams as you can, even in your own personal finances. I mean, I, I took two board slots and the board slots were really just because I want to go with some big companies that I know are going to make it through and get a salary and get some equity that's outside of, you know, the CDO club and the CDO summit. But I do want to jump back to one thing you said about um, Kodak and Blockbuster. You know, I was kind of famous for my tweets in the early days. I was always optimistic and positive and I never wanted to send out any negative tweets. And I read some articles that fear is the biggest motivator, right, for people. So I said, okay, let me do a fear-based tweet and see how it does. And it basically said, you know, if you think uh, digital transformation is not important, think about one, Blockbuster, two, Kodak, and three, Encyclopedia Britannica. Encyclopedia Britannica got yeah, their, yeah. their doors yeah. shut by Wikipedia and user-contributed content. Nobody can beat that business model because it's free. 
So if you think you're going to still be sending encyclopedias door to door, you know, you better change your business model, right? Same thing with Kodak. I mean, they missed these huge opportunities. And now, of course, with digital, you don't have to develop any film. And certainly Blockbuster, you know, the the, the writing was on the wall. And uh, everything's digital now. What do we need to go rent a VCR for? Get a VCR and VHR tape. So I think, you know, the digital transformation is now imperative. It's not a nice to have. It's not, you know, and that was, I wrote that tweet, you know, eight years ago. Uh, to be, you know, if you're if you're not focused on digital transformation, think about Kodak and Blockbuster. And now look, you know, like there are major companies that are at risk right now. And those include everyone we just talked about from Javits, real estate, you know, you name it. Uh, the ones that are doing well are going to be the Amazons and the Facebooks and the Googles. You know, they're all going to keep just chugging along. But uh, there are a lot of businesses that if they don't adapt today, they're not going to be here this time next year for sure. Oh, by the way, it's not just companies entire sectors are being rewritten. Absolutely. Dave, we need to bring you back as we get closer to closing out this year, because I know that we have, we'll have we have so much more to talk about as we move forward to, it's Q4, I can't believe it's Q4. I know. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, can't wait to continue the conversation. My pleasure. Thank you, Jen. You're so welcome. Thanks everyone for staying with us. I'm Jen Mercer Domsa, Vice President of US Development with Join Me Shad. Have a great day, everyone. See you soon.